gave this same speech in Mile City yesterday um, to a bunch of football coaches and all that. And I've been lucky to be affiliated with the university that I played for, that I've been able to um, have an impact. So since day one, since I graduated, it's just been a process to get back in there, okay? Um, and I'm very blessed to be able to be a part of that. Um, just right off the bat, um, got my bachelor's from Dickinson State, my master's from Dickinson State. I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist. I just train athletes. I get to wear sweats 365 days a year. It's a pretty good deal. Um, and then I'm also a block one coach is a new certification I got. It's uh, known as the most grueling, the hardest um, physically, mentally, um, think of it as boot camp. Um, you're going there and getting your ass kicked, pretty much. So, um, just got that done in Texas, what, five months ago, six months ago, something like that. So, that one's fun. Um, but very basically, um, my story from Worland, Wyoming, started there, um, played football, wrestled, track, uh, and then decided to go somewhere where I knew nobody. Um, usually, you either go get your bachelor's at Laramie in how to drink beer, or you go to Dickinson State, or you go to Black Hills. Well, um, we had a ton of people go to Black Hills, so I decided to go to Dickinson. Um, I was able to get my school paid for, and from there, I couldn't have made a better decision. Um, there's better scenery in Black Hills, and it's always kind of that battle, but I wouldn't be here today without DSU. They've done so much for me. It's very similar to Bags or Warland, having a very, very tight-knit group of people. You take care of people, they take care of you very well. So um, from there, upon graduation, I started my own strength and conditioning business, uh, Next Level Training. And then from there, as it grew, it grew into our gym now, um, the Iron Chapel Strength and Conditioning. So we have a 4,000 square foot gym, downtown Dickinson. And then from there, I've been able to be the strength and conditioning coach for the Dickinson State Blue Hawk football team um, and men's and women's basketball. And then this coming year, looking on taking on every single sport at the university. So it's, it's very fun there. So very, very basically, guys, I look at, Dickinson has had success, but this is, this is generic success across everything, okay? Um, boardroom, classroom, everywhere in between. So the pieces to the puzzle of how to achieve success, and I break it down into two uh, parts for the talk today. Um, the technical, the program, and the implementation, the day by day, how do I cue this squat? How do I lead this team, this group, okay? From there, the most important part is building the culture out of it, okay? Getting the kids to know you, getting the kids to buy into you as a person, not a coach, okay? So we'll break that down. We'll start with the technical side of things and move on from there. So um, as we know, um, the weight room, I need to have weight room success for the field. And that's why that is underlined and bolded so you can see it. My job is important, but it's not as important as performance on the field. My job is dictated from how they do on the field. If you look at um, large universities, D1s, all the way up to the very big D1s, um, the very first person when there's a coaching change that is fired is the strength and conditioning coach. It's just how it is. That is why I have my feet both in private sector and in the collegiate level because Everybody has their guy. Everybody has their guy that they want in. Coaching change, new strength staff. So I know that my job is dictated off of success on the field. So I need to have weight room success for the field, not on the field, okay? So you have to start small. And this is what I tell people. You have to look at your facilities. You have to look at your athletes and you have to look at your weaknesses. If I can answer those questions, I'm on the right track. So we start small, pick what makes sense for your program, okay? That everybody has their training program, every single person, me included, okay? Pick what works for you. You can't throw this fancy dancy thing when you have six man football team or eight man football team. We need to get the fundamentals, okay? So we gotta start small and yesterday, um, I told them I won't move on till I get an answer. So I'm just, uh, just forewarning. Um, what are the demands of football? What do, okay, let me rephrase that. What dictates success? What makes a football player successful? What's the demands of the sport? 
Uh, durability, uh, a lot of, you know, shoulders, back, a lot of injuries. There. Yep, yep. Um, he kind of tends to have some flows of knee injuries. Mm -hmm. um, and then they talk about success, uh, a lot of foot agility, quickness, and then, you know, hip drive. Yep, exactly. So we can, we can look at all of that encompassing into we need to be healthy, one, okay? A healthy player can help the team. Somebody riding the pine can't do that, okay? So we need to look at healthy, we need to be powerful, we need to have strength, and in most cases, the bigger, stronger athlete wins, okay? So I'm gonna make that very general so that we can dive in further later, but that's the demands of the sport. We need to start small. My answer for what are the demands of sport? We need to be able to combine all primal movements through space, okay? Here, here, in my next slide, every single movement, whether it's a punch step, okay? Whether it's a block, whether whatever it is, you're going through all planes of motion and you're using all the primal movements, okay? And I'll explain that, you'll know what that means afterwards. But it's just a combination of all primal movements. If you can strip down the sport and look at it from that level, everything you do comes back to that. So what sets apart Uncle Rico from the GOAT, okay? What sets these two apart physically, obviously, He's not the most physically statured human being, but that's when the mental capacity comes in, okay? So we have tangible tools physically and mentally that set apart Uncle Rico and Tom Brady. He may have better throwing power, okay? I can tell you that. But what sets them apart is the physical programming of that person and then the mental programming that we'll get to in the culture of the weight room, okay? So we're still under the technical phase here. Um, and we have to start with what is athleticism. If we want to make better athletes, if we want to make more athletic athletes, it's a very broad question. It's a very broad answer too. So if we want to make a better athlete, we have to define it, okay? In my definition from a strength and conditioning perspective, looking for success on the field is the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known or novel task, okay? And I'll break that down real quick. We have all seen, so let's look at seamlessly and effortlessly. We have all seen both sides of the spectrum. We've seen the Kobe Bryants where there's no thinking, no thinking involved. As a football coach, even as a wrestling coach, you do not want your, your players thinking because if they think, they're slow, okay? So we've all seen the athlete that thinks, said hut, and they get the deer in the headlight looks and they do this and they dump a pass right over the top of their head, okay? Or we see the athlete that knows exactly what's going on. He knows where he needs to be. She knows where she needs to be and we can get the accomplished task, okay? So the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly. Then we talk about combined primal movements. Everything that Kobe Bryant is doing right here, he's moving through all planes of motion, okay? Sagittal, transverse, and frontal. He's moving through all of our primal movements, which you don't see it until I explain it, but he's moving through all of our primal movements here. So what are our primal movements? And I talk about this because it gives the coaches something foundational. It gives you something to hold on, something tangible, okay? Because at the end of this, at the end of each section, I'm gonna give you an implementation page, okay? Something that you can take right now, implement it now, and take it and go, okay? Because I'm gonna throw a lot at you guys. So our primal movements, our squat, our step up, our lunge, okay, that's our lower body, squat, step up, lunge, vertical push, vertical pull, horizontal push, horizontal pull. And I'll have that up there, and I can talk to you guys afterwards if you guys need that. But it breaks it down into all human movement. Every single movement that's done in an athletic field can be brought back to those, okay? Um, so that's how we kind of break those primal movements down. And now we have to reverse engineer the demands of the sport. This is where we start, okay? If we can reverse engineer what they're gonna see on the field, mimic it in the weight room, that gets us back to weight room success for the field, okay? So, the demands, very basically, more power, more strength, and more hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is building muscle, okay? So, if we can do that, if we can take that, now we can mimic that and put it into our program. So if I can mimic the stimulus or make the stimulus harder to some demands, now they've seen harder work 
then playing Star Valley, then playing Newcastle, okay? They've seen harder stimulus. They're gonna win that game. That makes championships, that wins games, okay? So if we can make the stimulus something that's not new, by the time, I remember a few times going to play Star Valley, like we've been playing Torrington who hadn't won a game in a year, okay? We've been playing all these other teams and just kicking the crap out of them. Go to Star Valley, that's a new stimulus, okay? That's something that's new in my realm of strength and conditioning. So if we can implement all that, now they see it, now they know what's gonna happen as they go through. So then this gets us to our muscle contractions and our multiple planes. So this is where we'll be going next. In all sports, we have three types of muscle actions. Everything we do, okay? Me walking around, pacing here, I'm going through three muscle actions. Kobe Bryant, as he drives the lane, is going through muscle contractions, and there's three of them. We have eccentric, isometric, and concentric, okay? What that means, an eccentric is when my muscles are getting longer. There's tension pulling, gravity's pulling me down, the weight of the bar's pulling me down, the muscle's getting longer, okay? Then we have isometric, where gravity and the weight of the bar are equal to the force that I'm outputting, okay? So there's no change. The muscle's not neither getting longer or shorter, it's just producing equal amount of force against the force that's on it. And then we have concentric. Our concentric is everything we see in regular weight rooms, okay? It's going up quick, it's down up, okay? Down up. As soon as that muscle gets shorter, we're in that concentric phase. Reason I bring this up, and you'll, you'll know here as we go through, if we go through that in every single play, every single um, match, every single game, every single season, why don't we train that way in our weight room, okay? And it's very simple. This can be implemented in the smallest of towns. This can be implemented at the biggest of universities. This is exactly what we do at Dickinson State, and this is exactly what they do at University of Minnesota with Cal Dietz, okay? He's a much smarter man than myself. He has implemented this program, and I've been able to um, stand on the shoulders of giants. So as we go through, you have to remember eccentric, isometric, concentric as we move through all planes of motion. So this is absolutely, positively the most overlooked aspect of strength and conditioning, no matter the level, okay? This right here is king. This is what makes or breaks an off season, an in season, and helps every athlete in every successful program across the country. Anything that we do in excess is, is bad, okay? I used to say moderation's for cowards, and then I turned 26 and I feel like I'm 50, okay? My, my knees hurt, my shoulders hurt, I've had three shoulder surgeries, and things start to come, catch up to you. So um, anything, too much of anything is bad. And for some reason, in the, maybe it was the golden era of bodybuilding, your Arnold Schwarzeneggers, all these people, um, we have held, our, we have had our psychology, our human psychology be very, we are, we hold this here, our 90 to 100% one RM to way high of a standard, okay? When we ask, and maybe it's the NFL combine, okay? How much do they squat? How much do they bench? Those are the two staples that everybody goes to. Why is that important? It is important, but it's only, again, a piece to that puzzle, okay? In every single snap, in every single match, in every single play, every athlete on the court across the country is going through every single one of these, okay? They're not just sitting there going slow and fast, okay? So we need to make sure that we're hitting on all planes of these. So now we've reverse engineered. We know that the athlete goes through max strength, speed, strength speed, peak power, speed strength, and maximum velocity. Now we need to mimic that in the weight room, okay? So we have had this stigma that we need to be very strong. Well, if you sit here and you just do this, you're gonna have very strong, slow athletes. For some athletes, that works. Most athletes, it doesn't. With the landscape of what football is going to, a lot more spread, West Coast offense, this isn't gonna work, okay? We need to make sure, and for me, when I was growing up, it was bigger, faster, stronger, okay? Everybody in the country did bigger, faster, stronger. And at that time, that's what we thought was great, okay? Now, the research shows otherwise. So, examples in sport, in maximum velocity work, the dying play of football, kickoff, okay? The highest velocity any two forces on the football field will see is in kickoff. That's this, okay? 
OD lineman in the trenches. Very strong, but very slow in comparison to, okay? So we go through all these phases. If we can match that stimulus, very simply put, and put it into our program, we are going to have success, okay? So I have some examples of this. Um, we have a few football players here, um, both on a trap bar, okay? These are 75 pound trap bars, so I think we got about 255 here. Um, and then we got, I think, just under 500 on this one. So this shows us those two spectrums, what we can do in the weight room to mimic the sport, okay? So our high velocity work is shown here. Lighter in comparison to, he's jumping, moving the weight fast, resetting, okay? And the reason we do this, the reason we don't just go fast, 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 in football, it's always punch step, rest. In volleyball, it's always jump, hit, rest, okay? So we don't need to tie these things together. We need to have very intense bouts of exercise. Fast, rest, fast, rest, okay? So that's why we do these. Great alternative to get on that high velocity curve. And then we get here. This is Corbin Wood. I believe he's out of Ekalaka. Um, he, uh, this is just under 500. That is not fast. Not fast at all, okay? But that's very high force. And then you have the guy, the psychopath in the black jumping around, clapping everywhere. Um, somebody needs to talk to that guy. This is the spectrum that we have to look at in sports because this is what we see in weight rooms. This is what we see on social media, okay? You don't see this stuff because this is only 255 pounds. This is the stuff that wins games. This is the stuff that sells tickets, okay? So we need to make sure we see this delineation. If you, as the coach, wants what's best for your athlete, we have to implement something of this nature. Okay, so you can kind of see that difference. Very fast, very slow, but high force. Then we get into another few examples here. We have a more squat variation, and then we'll talk about quite possibly the most overlooked aspect of str strength and conditioning, high velocity med ball work. Okay, going very fast, implementing, implementing both uh, planes of motion and going off some reaction. So, very easily. We have Colin. Um, he's actually also a track star at our university. He is only at 185 pounds. Okay. He's going down, up fast, down, up fast. He's moving 185 as fast as he can. Okay. That's very important. We have a, um, let's go here. We have a, we have two principles or sayings or culture that we live by at Dickinson State University at my gym privately. Okay. You need, and it's called compensatory acceleration. So in the strength and conditioning world, Louis Simmons, he's king. He's, he's the founder of the best power lifters and athletes in the world. Okay. He looks like Yoda now. He's so, he's like this tall and kind of bent over, but he was a dude. Okay. Very good guy, but he came up with what's called compensatory acceleration. And it's something that we break on. We have every single day. So these kids know what's going on. And what compensatory acceleration means is producing the maximum amount of force in the middle amount of time. Okay. So you need to, everything we do on the football field is fast. Everything we do on the volleyball field or court is fast. We need to move the bar like it's 500 pounds and 500 pounds like it's the bar. Okay. So breaking that down, every single thing that you do is high force, high velocity. Even if you have 500 pounds on the bar, it's going to look slow. And you'll see that here. We have a 570 squat from our dude, Blake Murray out of Wyoming, I think Mountain View. Um, very good, very good squat, but it's slow. And that's what, that's what we have to look at. So you have to move this like it's this every single time in the weight room. So this is something that you can implement right now. Something very small. When you squat, when you deadlift, when you do whatever, has to be fast. There's no lollygagging because what we look at at Dickinson State and my philosophy as a whole, we have to care about how we get from A to B, okay? Not just getting from A to B. How do we get there? What's the implementation? What's the setup? What's the execution? We need to make sure that we can get from point A to point B most effectively because getting from point A to point B on the volleyball court doesn't win games. It's how you get there, okay? So 
Again, I talked about the most overlooked aspect of strength and conditioning, and it's this here. So high velocity med ball work, I'll play it and I'll break it down for you. Ready, ready, go. Good reaction. So he is on the frontal plane of motion. He has the outside leg up. He's pushing. So when we change directions, it's that frontal plane. We're pushing, we're driving out, okay? Another big thing on there. If we can implement 500 like the bar, the bar like 500, and reaction in our training, you will see increased success, I promise, okay? So when he's doing this, he's waiting for my cue. He's looking away from me. I stand behind him on purpose, okay? He can't see me, it's just like the gun in track. If I can have him react to my voice, not anticipate, okay? Because anticipating gets false starts. If I can have him react to my voice, just like the set hut, that is going to increase how fast he can react off of the ball, okay? So that's a huge concept we use on a daily basis with a lot of different things, um, and it's very overlooked. This is a very light med ball. You can get up to 100. Very light med ball, we're moving very quick, okay? Then we get into our high force. Blake Murray here, like I said, 570, I believe. Um, and then another guy that needs to check into a psych ward jumping around. So very slow, very powerful, but an all-American offensive lineman, okay? So he even, and this is where I want you to see it, yes, he's in the high force category right here, but he's still doing this. He's still doing this, okay? He's getting that whole entire curve um, as we go through. So this again gets us to the last part of our technical breakdown is the muscle contractions. We talked about eccentric, isometric, concentric, okay? This is how sports are played. There's nothing new in football. Football, excuse me, has evolved, but there's nothing new out of it. All it is is the combination of primal movements through the three muscle contractions, okay? So very basically, if we can do high force, high velocity, and use all three of the muscle contractions, that is a huge takeaway, huge takeaway for your kids, okay? And this is something that I've worked for a private strength and conditioning company in the past. This, isn't, this was not implemented. This is what we've done at the college, what we've done past, okay? This is something that I believe if it's left out, you're not reaching the potential of the children or the athletes, okay? So eccentrically, remember the muscles getting longer. I don't expect you to remember this. This is my geeky shit that I get into. Eccentrically, the muscle is getting longer and now we can control the tempo out of it, okay? So pretty simple here. He's gonna go off my cue. Two, one, go, go, good speed. Come on, love, good. Nice and easy, snap off the sound of my voice, snap, okay? So what this does is it helps loads the tissues and the tendons, and you'll see a picture of my injury. You would be hard pressed to find a worse lower body injury than a snap patellar tendon or an Achilles, okay? ACLs nowadays, it's not great, but we can come back from them pretty quickly, okay? Um, the success rate, a lot of times, the gift of injury is better. It can be. If you really look at injury as a gift, and you mold your tissues and you do all the right things after PT, you can be better than you were before because obviously there was a structural issue to begin with, okay? So this helps with that. This helps load those tendons. As I drive my knee forward, my patellar tendon's getting a lot of loading patterns in it, okay? So that muscle's getting longer. I'm increasing the time under tension so the, ten the tendons and the muscles are getting more damage, thus more growth. Okay, very simple, very easy. Um, in the apps that we use, we just throw in the tempo. It would look like, f this one was three seconds, it would look at three, zero, zero, zero. That's our tempo. It's a system that we've used all the way through. Then we get into isometric. Isometric is where that muscle is just producing force. There's no change, okay? This helps build stability. So when we think about, and I'll break this down real quick, when we think about change of direction, if we're looking at one-on-one -on -one basis, and this is huge for wrestling, if we look at a one-on-one -on -one basis, one v one, you versus the other guy, if I can have my athlete produce force, reduce force, and then reproduce force again faster than the other person, you're gonna win every single time, okay? And what I mean by that, it's kind of hard in dress pants, gotta hike these things up. Um, what I mean is when I'm accelerating, I got the ball here, 
I have to make a cut. I'm accelerating my mass. I decelerate my mass. Now we're in that isometric phase, nothing is changing, and I re-accelerate it. The faster I can do that, I'm gonna win, okay? That's that, that's that Deion Sanders, okay? That's the stuff that gets and wins games. Then in wrestling, if I snap, circle, snap, circle, and I take my shot, I accelerated, I decelerate when I get there, and I re-accelerate, okay? I do that faster, I win. That wins championships. So that's what isometrics helps with. Builds stability of the joint, builds integrity of the joint, and now we can produce force faster. These are 110s, by the way. Good. On a single leg. Taking those 110s for a ride, let's go. Kid's out of, kid's out of Alaska, he's a freshman, um, and he hang cleans like 330 pounds. It's astronomical. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so now we can allow the integrity of the joint to grow. We can use that for change of direction and explosive power. Now, even just more impressive, just to, on a different point on the force velocity curve, this is Derek Tabor. He is out of Kildare, um, North Dakota, homegrown boy, um, kind of got onto the squad as a guy that's going to be developed. Coach Stanton's done a very good job of that. Get JUCOs and get guys on their fourth year they're going to play. Well, Derek worked his ass off. He is an absolute stud. I'm going to have to stop this video within 10 seconds because he squatted 315 pounds 29 times. Okay. I don't have that much time with the presentation. So what this is, is that up and down quick. Okay. We're on that tempo. We're just going. This is what you see in weight rooms that don't have an established program. Just this. Okay. Which is great, but you're missing this stuff here, which is great in injury prevention. So you'll see with ease, 315 is not a lot for Derek. He's, he's an animal and probably one of the best kids I know. So he just keeps on going up and down. Okay. So that's how we use the implementation of eccentric, isometric, and concentric. And that gets us to our implementation of this. How can we, what can you guys take right now? Okay. So if you look at these boxes right here, I'll move here. If we can ask and answer these questions, you now have a program you can make. Okay. Very, very simply put. So we need to reverse engineer. What are the athletes exposed to? If it's wrestling, volleyball, or football track, whatever, what are the athletes exposed to? What dictates success? Why is star Valley? Why is Powell so good? Okay. They have athletes, they have coat. What is it? Okay. What are they exposed to? What dictates success? And what are our weaknesses? Okay. Our weaknesses are different than everybody else's. So we ask those three questions. We now program. Okay. We program based off of that. So what are they exposed to? They're exposed to high velocities, very abnormal joint angles, and then our power strength and hypertrophy. And then we obviously have to have an anaerobic demand, just conditioning. Okay. So I'll kind of show you how we break that down on our team builder, how we program, and then we'll get to the last part of the presentation. So now I have to implement all the primal movements, squat, step up, lunge, vertical push, vertical pull, horizontal push, horizontal pull across all velocity and force, force and velocity points. Okay. And it sounds like a lot. Okay. But I will make this very simple umbrella and it shows you very basically, I'm a very analytical dude. It shows you very basically what we can do here. So let me see if I can get to it. It was pretty simple last time. Oh, trash can. Perfect. So, um, I don't know if I can, I'll just keep it at this size. So very basically guys, this is our first winter conditioning series. Okay. During this winter, it's a very different year cause COVID, but, um, this is how we implement it. And I want to kind of break this down. Give me 30 seconds. So we talked about eccentric, isometric, concentric. When we're thinking muscle actions, we're doing two week phases. Okay. So every single primal movement, hang clean, bench press, trap bar, deadlift, and back squat, every single primal movement we do, we're going eccentrically. We're focusing on that eccentrically. Okay. So we go through two week blocks and then we move on to ISOs and then we move on to concentric. The biggest thing here, then we talk about force velocity, right? This is how we do it because at the end of the series, at the end of the conditioning, I can say I squatted for power five times. I squatted for strength five times and I squatted for velocity five times. Then you can make it, man, my team is slow. 
I need to do more speed work, okay? I need to do that seven times instead of five. It makes it very simple math for you, okay? Um, and this is what I implement across the state of North Dakota, um, few people in Wyoming, but we implement this for high schools, we implement this for colleges, and it's very easy and simply put. So here, it's hard to see, but we hang cleaned for five reps. That's the most you should probably ever do on a hang clean, okay? Well, very simply, my hang clean now goes to Monday. Now I'm doing it for one, okay? So this is, that, this is that progression as we go down. Now I can hit it for one, I just hit it for speed, now I'm hitting it for, or for force. So that's, that's a very simple way to implement everything that you need in your program, okay? Boom, that's simple. Um, so in this picture, just like I was talking, high force, high velocity, weird joint angles at the ankle and the hip, or excuse me, ankle, knee and hip, and we're going very fast, okay? And then this is just, I have some results, I won't show it for the sake of time. But with this guys, oh, I'm doing all right. With this, um, we had amazing results this year. It's the best winter conditioning that I've had in a strength and conditioning, the collegiate strength and conditioning ever, okay? Um, and I, the reason I say this is it's twofold. Yes, the programming has to be perfect. The programming has to do this. I have to cue the right way. I have to do all the day by day, the coaching stuff that all you guys do, okay? I have to do that right. But if my culture isn't there, if the trust isn't there, if the communication isn't there, if somebody takes my programming, which has happened very often, and they implement it, you're gonna get a different result. It's, it's, it's different, there's something behind it. It's just like, it's just like doing Zoom school. It's different, okay? There's something behind it. There's the human interaction behind it. And so I tell you this, we had amazing numbers. I've never seen like 80, 80 pounds, 100 pounds, like crazy numbers that you should not see because of the buy-in, not because of me, okay? So that's where we get to the second part and the shorter part of the presentation. Um, you always hear, start with your why, and it sounds freaking cliche, okay? Start with your why, start with your why. My why is coming from small town Wyoming, being underprivileged to a sense, middle class. My parents said, you better get a hell of a lot better at football because we're not paying for your college, okay? So that kind of put a little fire under my ass. Well, I started burning the candle light or the candle at both ends, okay? So I've had three major, major shoulder surgeries, um, biceps, tendon, rotator cuff, labrum mostly, um, just hundreds of dislocations. And I snapped my patellar tendon in Miles City, Montana, um, ended my football career. So from that though, you have to start with your why. And this is not that little mission statement that you make like, I wanna make an impact, okay? We wouldn't be in coaching if we didn't wanna make an impact, all of us, okay? Everybody upstairs, everybody at this conference, they wanna make an impact, okay? But we need to get down to the nitty and gritty. So we start with our why, and my why is I never want any kid, any athlete to have to go through what I've gone through with shoulder surgeries, with knee surgeries, and if I can do something, if I can do something that prevents them from that, I'm a happy guy. Then we get to the more personal stuff. Um, when you have surgeries, when you are an all-conference outside linebacker for the university, pain medication is very readily available. And this is something that's, Colby, don't talk about this. This is swept under the rug, okay? Pain medication is very readily available. I would say it's a pretty direct correlation between surgery and addiction, okay? There's a pretty good correlation behind that. If I can stop that through strength and conditioning and make sure they don't have to go through this crap, then I can ensure that they have less exposure to something that could ruin their entire life because it ruined mine to some extent and I've been there, okay? So if I can do that, that's my why. So I need to start with that and I need to vocalize that. I'm very transparent with my past, with my issues with pain medication, with injuries, I'm very transparent about it. You need to start with your why because you don't realize the impact you can have on the kids on each and every day, you don't. Um, it's, it's each kid, each interaction, each day across the entire school, okay? And we, all of us in here are in that position to have that impact on those kids. So pretty simply put, getting to that culture change. How have we built this culture at Dickinson State and at my gym and everywhere we've gone? Um, a very good book, it's called Switch, How to Change Things When Change Are Hard, okay? A few brothers wrote this book. 
And it's very simple. He breaks it down very well so we can kind of see how to get that behavior change. First, we need to direct the rider. Give clear directions and reduce mental paralysis. This is the rider here. This is that rational side. This is every coach. I mean, I, got, I have an ego for sure. Um, every coach has an ego attached, okay? If we can direct this rider, the rational side of our mind, we're in good standing. Then we need to motivate the elephant. The elephant is our emotional side, okay? Find the emotional connection with your athletes. And this isn't very popular in my, in my uh, industry. I'm supposed to be bald, big beard, and just be an asshole. Like that's, that's my perception, okay? So it, when we start talking emotions and getting all fuzzy and warm, it doesn't go well, okay? So we need to find the emotional connection with our, our kids. These though, there's a direct correlation. If these are out of whack, good luck moving the elephant. Good luck instilling culture. Good luck getting people to come to summer training. Good luck, okay? We're not gonna be able to do it. So we need to have these in coordination with each other. Then we need to shape the path. We need to reduce obstacles. We need to tweak the environment to some extent. Sometimes we need to put roadblocks in front of our kids. Have to. But sometimes we need to reduce the obstacles, reduce the choices that they can make, and let them go. In football, volleyball, track, if you can just say, go. And they do what you need to do, okay? So, very basically, that's what we need to do. Direct the rider. We need clear and concise goals, and this gets us to our breakdown of that, okay? So, um, in every session, in every workout, in every winter conditioning, in every season, in every calendar year, we have micro and macro goals, okay? So if I'm starting with my why, if I'm trying to direct the rider, I need to be able to look at my micro goals and establish them and correlate them to my macros. Meaning, if I have an athlete and I'm telling him, you have to hammer your big toe, you have to hammer it into the ground, we're gonna get more glute engagement, we're gonna do all these things. Coach, why? Why? Why, why would you have me do that, okay? Well, Research shows that this is going to help with ACL injuries. This is gonna get more post to your chain. This is going to help you be a better athlete, which in turn can help us win games, okay? So we need to be able to tell them the why of the session and correlate it to we wanna win championships, okay? So this is with everything that you do. If you can provide the why behind it, they're going to, they're going to care. They're going to dive in instead of do it because I said so. And don't get me wrong, there is a time and place for that but we need to give them the why behind it and the direction that they want, okay? And then we need to reduce the mental paralysis. We've all seen the athlete, like I talked about, just can't go because they're thinking, they don't wanna mess up. Coach Stanton always says, mess up, go 100 miles an hour. If you're gonna mess up, go 100 miles an hour. Coach Hofflin, 100 miles an hour, okay? That's something we need to do. We need to reduce all that paralysis. And then this gets us to our second principle. I talked about our second principle in strength and conditioning and it's um, the principle of move the dirt, okay? I break out, uh, we break down on this every day. It's built in with the culture. Um, John Wellborn, 10-year NFL vet, he played for the Kansas City Chiefs, a little bit the Eagles. Um, very good dude. One of the, one, he was one of the first offensive linemen over 330 pounds with 10% body fat. It's, that, that's some guy you don't, wanna, you don't wanna mess with. So he talks about moving the dirt. And moving the dirt is like, or football is like moving a big ass pile of dirt, okay? Some days you get a spoon, some days you get a backhoe, some days you get a, a shovel. But as long as we're moving the dirt in the same direction as a team, we can accomplish anything. So what you are given that day, if you're given a spoon, well you better damn get after it with that spoon, okay? You're sick, you just broke up with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, we get that give your best on that day with whatever implement that you have, okay? That's how we direct that rider. Then, motivating the elephant. Um, and this is where a lot of people, their eyes open up a little bit. Um, and if I could have you guys implement one thing from all this nonstop banter that I've given you the last 45 minutes, is implement this. I started implementing this my first year as the strength and conditioning coach at Dickinson State and it's changed, it's changed things, okay? So um, I get into tapping into the emotional side, getting nice and fuzzy as a strength coach here. Um, so we, we have what's called why meetings. 
And I took this from a coach that is much smarter than myself. And it's very simple. It takes about four, three, four minutes with every athlete. And this allows them to drop their walls, allows them to trust you, you trust them, and get to the stuff that if I'm saying, hey, how's your day going? Or how's class going? Like, we're not getting to the real, the real molecular, the real 1,000 foot view of things, okay? It's just a little bit of banter. So we have three questions, very easy. I print these pages off. I, I sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and we go over it. So if you weren't a football player, track star, volleyball player, whatever you want, if you weren't a um, chemical engineer, whatever it is, okay? What would you be doing right now if there was no restrictions and the thing is with kids, they get caught in the experience they're in right now. Well, coach, I ran a five flat 40. I'm not going to go play at Bama. We get that. Okay. What would you do if there was no restrictions? Dreams. Okay. And we get some crazy, crazy stuff out of this. Travel, be with family, military, run a business, all these things. Okay. And then question number two is the hardest question for them to answer. It's the hardest question for me to ask. Okay. But this is where culture is built right here this question okay what is the most difficult thing you've gone through in your life this is the stuff that the kids carry baggage they, they they're not going to tell you unless you ask this question a lot of them we've had a bunch of kids parents died grandparents died transferring to dsu going to a different college breaking up with a girlfriend breaking up with a boyfriend this is the stuff that Without asking, they're not gonna tell you, you wouldn't know. And now I've seen grown ass men and grown women cry in front of me, okay? This is the stuff that you have to know about your athletes and it's a simple, easy question, okay? Then lastly, to cap it all off and bring it back, who is the most influential person in your life? You ask that question, you're gonna get moms, dads, brothers, teammates, which is really cool to see. Then you get their phone number and you call that person. Okay, so you call this person, you say, hey, Joe Blow, just to let you know, like you got a great kid, I love training him. You were put down as the most influential person in their life. Okay, that rings, that rings true to a lot of people. Like that gives you the goosebumps that I've got right now, because this is a cool moment um, for a lot of people. You can show them that they care and you show that it's hard because we all have imposter syndrome. Okay, we're the uh, superintendent. You don't realize how many people look up to you. None of us do, okay? So you can see this and implement this with these parents. You call them, well, the athlete call, talks to that person and that person talks to the athlete. That shows that you care. You took the five minutes to show that you care for that athlete and that family, okay? This is something that you can use for motivation. This here, as long as it's within means, you can use this for mot motivation. Hey, why did you start this? Why are you here? Do this weight because of X. Okay, this is something you can use for motivation and it works really, really, really well. And then last, creating and shaping the path. Okay, this is the last slide here. Um, creating bonding experiences is huge. So we have what's called our Katana program at uh, Dickinson State and Tanner actually went through this and the, a Katana is a very sought after weapon. Okay, we all, it's a, it's a sword to some extent um, and it's a very sought after weapon, but they take raw materials, okay? Very raw materials, fold and fold and fold and keep on folding. It's the most sought after weapon in the world. That's what we wanna tra train our red shirts to be, okay? A weapon on the football field. We want them to be a very effective weapon. So we go through the Katana program and the Katana program is building, <laughs> building teamwork, building a unit with shared suffering. It's hard, it's not easy. You came here for one reason, and that's to play football and get your education. So we create that through bonding experiences. We have one-on-ones. So at my gym, I created what's called the strength council. These are not the guys that start by any means, okay? They could be, but these are the guys that work their ass off every single day, no questions asked. They come to me, they ask how high, that's it. Okay? There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We create one-on-ones. We create this strength council. They come, we have coffee, we have donuts, we hang out. It's a one-on-one -on -one experience. This is a church event. You can go to a church event. You can share, um, say you're at the high school level, like, hey, I'm presenting my last project in class. I'll be there. 
okay? The small things that takes just a little bit extra time, it's on top, but all of us would do it because that's why we got into coaching, okay? And then lastly, establishing responsibility. Giving the responsibility, so we talked about our tempos. If you're in a group at Dickinson State and you're not doing the tempos that I've established, your teammates are gonna grill you, and that's what you need, okay? You need the kids to do that work because you have so much else going on, you're not holding the line, you're not holding the company line, you get reprimanded for that. And very lastly, guys, I talk about this, I'm, I, I've been imp, implanted into a very successful, culturally diverse program at Dickinson State, okay? So, I like to say this, success is a two-fold process, okay, by, by all means. It's the day-to-day, -day and it's the culture. And if you can establish a culture with the day-to-day, you are going to have winning programs. That's what we all see in winning and successful programs is the day-to-day, -day, the coaches know what's going on, they have good programming, and then we also have the culture there. And this is classroom, boardroom, weight room, whatever it is, okay? This could be, this whole presentation, I could change some words, and this could be a motivational speech for a Fortune 500 company, okay? So this is the stuff that helps make or break high school weight rooms, college weight rooms onto the field, okay? Thank you guys for making it at 9 a.m. I appreciate you.